since 19, or two, rather 2006, I've worked with a small law firm, just two of us, and all we do is compliance and ethics work. The other person is uh, Rebecca Walker, uh, my longtime law partner, who's absolutely the best in the business. And if it wasn't for her, I'd probably have been thrown out or who knows what. But she's uh, kept the ship afloat uh, to a great degree. Uh, and what we do is we help companies develop uh, and assess compliance and ethics pro programs. So uh, sometimes we do that when the company's in trouble and they have to show the government that they're trying hard to stay out of further trouble. But sometimes the companies, uh, and particularly their boards of directors, just want a second set of eyes, somebody who's unbiased um, and also uh, experienced, very experienced, and sort of knows what works and what doesn't. And so we get to review compliance programs for those situations, mostly the latter. But, you know, there are, we've done for the Department of Justice, the Securities Exchange Commission. We've done it um, uh, for the World Bank, I think, on four occasions for the United Nations. And so it's, it's uh, uh, all that it was cracked up to be. Um, for us, uh, the uh, work is about half in the U.S., half outside. One of our biggest uh, assessments was of, of BP when it got in trouble, um, and <laughs> yeah, uh, we, um, and we've also you know done this for in, in Asia and Africa and other places as well. So it's uh, it's just great work, and uh, I hope to be doing it for a long time to come. And the son can laugh when he sees me uh, twenty years from now. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. So rolling back to to where you were when you started, you were a young lawyer. Had you been working in industry or just straight into practice? Or yeah, I so what I did. Um, so sort of my transition was as follows. Uh, I. Got out of law school in 1980, a few years as a legal aid lawyer, then went to the other side and defended uh, rich uh, ne'er-do-well corporations, uh, what's called white-collar crime, and biz businessmen. Uh, but then I had, I don't know if it's fair to call it a road to Damascus experience uh, or not, but I will. Uh, in 19, uh, yeah, 1987, I got involved in a case which changed my view of how uh, to look at a lot of these situations. And it was a case involving an industry which is pretty obscure, but I guess pretty big. And it turned out that there had been fraud committed on the sales side of that um, industry for more than 40 years. Excuse me. And what's remarkable is that it seemed like everybody in this industry was doing this thing. Um, and the reason that's important is that uh, I had, and a lot of people have, and, uh, a view of, of the causes of white collar crime that they're sort of indelibly uh, marked in each individual, that the people are the good people or bad people, and you can't do much about it. Uh, and, you know, that's, there's a lot, certain logic to that, of course. But what I found from this case is that if everyone's doing it, then the role of character uh, is not what we thought it was. It's much more the situation, the context. Uh, and if that's the case, which I think it is, um, then there's um, uh, a, lot, a lot that you can do about it, and that's called compliance and ethics. Uh, and it's, it's interesting. I, I live in Princeton. I guess it's sort of hard to tell over Skype. But uh, there was an experiment conducted uh, actually several times in, in Princeton. I think the first time was in 1973, which showed that when individuals were asked to go to, to do a chore and half of them were told that they're um, late for something, they, sh they should rush, and the other half were told uh, that they had time on their hands, and all of them were confronted along the journey with um, uh, what appeared to be somebody in severe physical uh, stress, somebody who needed help. 
And what the experimenters found was that notwithstanding you know, how strong this pull was, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, notwithstanding yeah, how strong this pull, pull was, um, sorry, I'm sorry, I just got a little off in thought. Can we take, take, it, I just yep, take, take, take it from the top, I can edit that out. So, right. so you're back to Princeton and the experiment? Or the... Yeah, and this is an experiment. So basically what it showed is that people who um, were uh, put in a situation where there was a lot of pressure on them, pressure to, um, to get something done, were much – oh, jeez, I, I can't I'm keep losing this thought. It's okay. Yeah. Let me just. Yep, gather your thoughts. Yeah, you know, no, can we skip it? It's, it's yeah. too. Yeah, okay. Well, do, do you know if I can find a link to that that thing? It's a Princeton, it, what would it be called? The Theological Seminary Study. Okay. You know, I have a blog which has a lot of this stuff. Oh, I'd love to see. Except, can you send me a link to that when we've finished? To the blog? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's called the Conflict of Interest blog. Fantastic. I'd like to hear more about that. Uh, yeah, well, actually, I will, I will say more about it yeah. as we go on. I just right. the specifics of the, the actual experiment were. Um, but did they, as, as, as a result of that, did the people who were under stress, did they stop to help the people or not? The, what it showed was that there, if you put uh, what appears to be sort of a reasonable amount of pressure, it o greatly overrides whether somebody is a good person or a bad person. Right. And that it context counts. Uh, the situation counts, and that in turn leads one to the conclusion, I think, that there's more that you can do, uh, whether it's compliance and ethics training, auditing, having codes of conduct, having CEOs involved, having board involved. None of those things are worth doing if people are basically um, all good or all bad. Uh, if that's the case, then why bother? But if people really are susceptible to good, strong, uh, or, or yeah, strong influences, both positive and negative, then you should do more. And you should do more means companies should do more and the government should do more. So that was 1987, my road to Damascus uh, experience. And that convinced me that compliance and ethics was worth focusing on because at the time we uh, I started getting involved and started giving speeches and then doing client work um, at, the t at that time there was almost no compliance and ethics field there was um, some of the defense industry companies did this kind of work uh, uh, certain I guess in some financial services there was but nothing like you have today, where it's uh, really a huge field in its own right, with its own uh, field of knowledge. Um, a lot of money goes, a lot of time, a lot of senior executive time goes into it. And that's, I think, all predicated on the notion that this can actually do some good. Uh, and th therefore, that's why I started devoting my attention to it. And so I started, again, with, with, I think just a, a, one article in 1988. I got connected to uh, Joe Murphy, who had written a couple books on this and is really the founder and the father of the field. Um, I put, put on with Joe a conference, started doing conferences at the conference board and research there, uh, became associated with uh, the Ethics and Compliance Initiative, which used to be called the Ethics and Compliance Association. Um, and uh, there did a lot of work and really became, and I'm, a lot of it was on a pro, pro bono basis, a lot of it became um, sort of the basis for the kind of counseling I uh, do. So, um, so that's sort of basically how I got started and uh, <coughs> into this day. How did you... How did you kind of um, sell it into your clients and to potential clients then, as as a, as a legal positioning? Well, often, uh, often I tried and failed, particularly in the early years. There was there were some winning years, um, but essentially, uh, as the government began to take it more seriously, 
then companies began to take it more seriously. And um, then that made my job easier. But I did spend a lot of time uh, at conferences and classes. I taught in NYU's business school uh, for many years, uh, talking about, uh, I guess you could call it the parade of horribles, all the uh, nasty things that can happen to those who uh, don't try to prevent wrongdoing. And it's basically involved a way of thinking that at least we Americans uh, aren't all that good at, which is preventive thinking. Um, and most people just don't see that as something, you know, I'll worry about that tomorrow. And uh, you know, obviously there are exceptions. Preventive medicine is a pretty good exception. Um, but uh, for law, preventive law was pretty new. And when that's a way of sort of thinking about compliance and ethics. Uh, practice, and so it took you know it took many years of you know, beating the bushes to get clients to say yes, I want that, and then not just want it; they need to have the budget for it. Um, but increasingly, they they do. Can you paint a picture for me for just to get an idea of the the climate back then when you were starting off? You said the parade of horribles, and the, you know people were starting to wake up to this. Tell me, give me an idea of the era. That you were starting uh, the era yeah. of business. Uh, oh, well, it's hard to say. You know, there. I mean, it's always been a mix. Um, early, you know, there had been a financial crisis uh, in the eighties, and that did feed into this. Um, uh, I wouldn't say the, the the average business person was better or worse than they are now, but they what they did have was a lot of this compliance and ethics um, methodologies and commitment. So on a net basis, uh, they were better. And there, there really was very little. I, I can remember going to the what I think was the very first meeting of ethics officers in 1992 in, um, in Raytheon in uh, Massachusetts. And I think there were 19, a total of 19 people representing the whole country. Uh, you know, more recently than that, I went to a conference uh, held by the Society for Corporate Compliance and Ethics, and it had close to 2,000 people. Wow. Off the top of your head, can you remember, the 19 is almost an apost apostolic number. Can you remember who those people were? Jeez, uh, now, now you're... Do you think Joe, Joe Murphy, was he there? No, I don't no. think so. Um... Can you even remember who convened it? Uh, I think Raytheon. Okay. Yeah, the, the Raytheon guy was named Paul. Uh, Greg Graydon Wood was there from a phone company. Um, there were other people there. For, it was basically phone companies and defense contractors. And so I'm sure, yes, yeah, there was a guy from uh, Martin Marietta, which became Lockheed Martin. Uh, a former general who was very good at giving uh, speeches and, and it was very funny too. So that's about five of them. But uh, and what, what, what was the kind of conversations you were having there? I mean, it was obviously quite exploratory and, you know, people, you were trying to found a kind of a whole part of the discipline. So what kind of discussions did you have? Uh, well, a lot of it is just benchmarking. You know, at the time there was not much that was being published uh, not that many sort of formal speeches. So people often learn what to do by seeing what, you know, the fellow next door was doing. Um, and, you know, what do you do for training? What do you do for um, a hotline, which they sort of had? How do you make people want to call the hotline? How do you address the you know, fear of retaliation? Do, you, do your auditors look for compliance topics or is your auditing just financial auditing? Um, what do you do when somebody gets caught? Do you uh, treat them as more severely if they're a senior person? Do you treat them less severely if they're a senior person? So, at, and I'm speaking now not just of the one conference, but really all of them uh, in the 90s. And then, you know, as it became more and more developed, the presentations became more and more formal, handouts, samples, materials were included with them. 
uh, and it became sort of this big business in and of itself, the conferences. Um, and there will be hundreds of people there. But I think it's very valuable. And I think the important thing is to make the connections with others, uh, to have someone to talk to if things get, um, you know, sort of scary, which they can for compliance people. I mean, if you're investigating someone who turns out to be the boss's nephew, um, you know, you may want to, really some people will want to think twice about it. Uh, but if you're talking to clients and ethics um, counterparts at a company like yours, then it's easier. And um, tell me, I mean, you had your, your seven-year-old son raising his eyebrow uh, at you coming home with this video, which I'd love to know. Who, I'd love to know who made that video or if what was on it. But um, what, which case was in your early career was the one that you said, okay, I, I'm doing some, this is working. This is an important thing I, I'm doing here. Oh, you know, they all sort of blend together, but I think, um, you know, when we see where they, you can't really tell tell much by where a company is right when you leave them because they're going to want to put on their best uh, foot. But when you go back a few years later and see all the stuff they've done, uh, then that's positive. I mean, I, for example, just two days ago was reviewing the compliance program of a company I, I uh, gave advice to two years ago, and they were pretty uh, hapless or hopeless uh, when we did this in two years ago, and they had few policies and no training, and their you know undue exposure to corruption. Uh, excuse me. Um, and now they pretty much filled all the holes and. I'm not saying that no one else could have done it but me. I'm sure a lot of people are doing it. But that they're seeing it's done. I'd, like, I'd love to know what the relationship, because it's not like a typical relationship that a lawyer would have with a client. Um, you might differently. I'd like to know, is it a long-term relationship? Or are you brought in as a firefighter or, as you say, more of a preventative as a curator or shepherd? Mostly the latter. Uh, there are times when we're part of the firefighting. Um, can't really mention names because of its confidential nature of, of the work. Um, but I would say about 20% of it is firefighting. And, and we're not defense lawyers. We're not, um, you know, sort of in a combative mode. Rather, we're there to help to say, okay, some things happened here that shouldn't have. Let's figure out how to prevent them from happening any other times. Um, and, uh, that work is work that usually is a uh, individual engagement, uh, and, and you may never hear from them again. Um, but there are definitely clients, you know, some of the bigger, more sophisticated ones, who uh, like to have an ongoing relationship, even if it's not a lot of work, but just so they can sort of double check things and you know test their instincts. Um, and I guess maybe we're. It's funny I. I'm reminded of uh, seeing a client um, executive in the hallway at, at the client's uh, headquarters. And he looked at me, he smiled, he said, oh, nice to see you again. And then he paused and he said, no, no, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> so so tell, tell me, in, in, um, I'd like to know your relationship then internally. When you, Who you report to typically? Is it the board, the CEO, uh, or whatever? And then... Also, the relationship between you and the internal legal people, is there any friction there? No, it's usually the legal people who hire us. Uh, um, they're, you know, they're happy to have someone like uh, Rebecca and me, and or me, um, because they don't have you know, decades of experience and therefore are more likely to make a mistake um, that could reflect poorly on them. So I've, in my experience, they're often the driver for compliance and ethics. And who would, in an in individual engagement we report to, really depends. I mean, usually actually it is the compliance officer, uh, but, and rarely the CEO, because he or she wants to be spending more time making money and less time spending it. Um, and the board uh, or the audit committee, more than sort of the full board, uh, is occasionally part of our reporting relationship, though um, 
Mm, not not that often, and it, it can be sort of on a dotted line basis with the main reporting going to the to general counsel. That's excellent. And do you notice a kind of in this uh, you know over say thirty years worth of meeting lawyers within the organisations? Have you noticed any change in their attitudes towards ethics and compliance? Yeah, they're very um, very much in favour of it now, more than more than the past. I and mean, there's an image I don't know if it was ever true that the lawyer is just the hired gun that doesn't do what's right. You know, it's just there to uh, you know throw roadblocks in the way of regulators, and and to do so uh, regardless of whether it's good for the company as long as it's good for the CEO or other senior executives. And what happened in recent U.S. is there, um, uh, there came to be some changes in ethics rules, mm-hmm. making it clear that the lawyer um, is, that the advisor like me uh, has, or the in-house lawyer, either one, mm-hmm. are responsible to the company and not to individuals. And that therefore, the incentives have changed, and uh, the, I think is much more of a welcoming attitude than um, there was previously. Now, the danger of that is, of course, then that there's a liability issue for the that person. Um, has that is is that a good development or not? I I haven't seen much of it, um, except. The only industry where you see that, and it's based on this particular statutory scheme, at least in the U.S., is financial services. Uh, maybe somewhere else, but not that it comes to mind. Um, and uh, yeah, I think there's a lot. There are a lot of consultants trying to sell that as the basis for you know taking various steps, but for the most part, not. Um, the, so I, do I you think, feel has anybody ever been thrown under the bus? Uh, you know, has it? Oh uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, not by me, and, and not with my acquiescence. Mm. I mean, I'll tell you a funny story in that regard. Uh, I had a client, uh, financial services firm, in fact, where the CEO wanted to get rid of um, uh, another executive, and so he said. Find out if he's taking ethics training, firm's ethics training, and if he hasn't, we can fire him for that. And I said, before, I said, before I look, did you, Mr. Lee, look like you were going to get a So we, we didn't go further with that. Excellent. That's a very good story. Okay. Um, you talked a little bit about, you know, you sort of said, uh, you know, in, in the American experience, obviously, which you're familiar with, but you also have a global practice. So are there differences uh, culturally or? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's harder. You know, there are some cultures where it's much more, um, it's harder to get people to speak up against or concerning their, uh, their bosses. Um, and... Yeah, I and mean, that's that's the biggest difference. You know, they're much more of a um, uh, hierarchical. Con- you know. yeah. And I don't want to mention particular countries because uh, you could say it about it pretty much in any of them. Yeah. But but some, I mean, you know, particularly in Asia uh, uh, and to some extent in Africa, but more Asia. Yeah, it's just very hard to get people to to speak up or speak out. Well, uh, I, uh, some of the other. People who talked to said that for a lot of the more Asian countries, the relationship in business is more important than the rules. Uh, you know. Sure. Yeah, do you agree with that? You know, uh, I agree that there's some of that. I mean, it's changing, um, but you know, you're dealing with patterns of behavior and ways of looking at the world that are thousands of years old, literally. Mm-hmm. Whereas the new uh, way of thinking, the compliance and ethics way of thinking. You know, it's decades old, not millennia. And a, and a post-industrial kind of uh, view, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah no, it is. Um, you know, I do think uh, it, it will change because of global pressures. You know, I think shareholders will want better ethics performance. And, you know, that can get, you know, even if it's not thousands of years baked in, if shareholders are really clamoring for that, and I'm not saying that it happens a lot, but it happens some, then that can be a powerful force for change. 
Could you walk me through, I mean, say you have a, you know, Acme Enterprises, new client, they want, they bring you in, um, they say, look, we, we have no ethics of compliance here. How do you, can you walk me through the process of, of setting up a program? Sure. So the first thing you do is you have to figure out what the needs are, because one size doesn't fit all. Um, and uh, for that, you typically conduct what's called a risk assessment. And a risk assessment, which is based mostly on interviews, but could be other things, company interviews, um, is, um, to put this, you know, really sort of the foundation for everything. And the, government, the law says so, common sense says so. You know, there are things that a financial services company needs to focus on that a manufacturing one doesn't. Uh, same sort of analysis with respect to the risks based on locations and cultures and industries. Uh, and you know, so you need to do that. So typically we would do interviews, could be a lot, could be little. Um, you know, we're doing one now, which probably has 20 interviews, but they need, it needn't be that many. Um, and though sometimes it's more. And you base, you, based on that, the results of those interviews, you come up with a list of things to do. Uh, first of all, do we have the right policies based on the risks, based on the industry best practice? No, well, then let's draft, draft them or hire somebody to do that. Do we have a code of conduct that um, is not embarrassing? A lot of them are around for a long time. Same thing. I mean, have an internal team develop uh, a code for the company. Uh, after we have the code and policies, developing um, training and other communications, you know, town hall comments from the CEO and others, uh, having an agenda, uh, a year living planning uh, document, a uh, map, really, I guess, uh, for compli compliance training and other measures. So you not only have this stuff, but you stick stick to your plans. Um, work moving to further down the timeline, develop um, methods for auditing uh, to make sure that all these things are done. There are a lot of companies you've seen which had anti-corruption uh, compliance programs that they just didn't follow. Um, they had the great paper, as one of the clients said, but not much was done to, to further it. Um, and let me just see what else. Uh, oh, yeah, and developing a compliance office. Um, so that's, in some companies, that can be a major undertaking, you know, dozens of compliance people. Um, I remember Citibank, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal years ago, had 1,700 compliance people. Wow. Uh, that's enough to kill any party. <laughs> uh, and tell me, how how do you um how do you me evaluate performance and measurements and metrics against that? What sort of tools do you use? Well, you use benchmarking numbers. Uh, I mean, sometimes you do have focus groups. I'm not that big a fan of them because I don't think people will tell the truth yeah. in them uh, or in surveys. Um, but you know, there are things. You know, the number of phone calls to the hotline. Uh, you know, that's a, a metric. You know, the number of incidents, audit uh, failures uh, can be a good metric for compliance, mm -hmm. success and failure. And, and a lot of, and some of it's more anecdotal than it is. Um, Have you ever uh, um, put, you know, had a a client, I'm mean, not mentioning any names, but have you ever opened the paper and go, oh, my God, you know, what have they done? Uh, yeah, <laughs> not that many. They, they, you know, I would try to get in, get in before then. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah, there's some of that, and uh, you know, a lot of these companies are very big. Um, you know, I mentioned BP before. You know, it's the size of a small city. Uh, were, you, were you working around the time of the Gulf spill? After. After, yeah. Uh, and and I think it, it, I can mention that because the company's mentioned it. Um, but you know, reviewing a compliance program in that context, you know, or any other, uh, you know, basically just involves looking at all the stuff they said they did. Is it the right stuff? Did they really do it? Is it documented? 
uh, what is what's their long term plan for having this stand the test of time? Yeah, that that creeps into some of it is ethics and compliance. Some of it then goes into actual sort of decision making and and processes that go on, on within the organization. Is there a blur between those boundaries? Between well, I mean, for instance, with the girls, they they, they took seri a series of actions. Some of them were, you know, ultimately good, but some of them, you know, were were failures in in their their uh, the initial reaction to the to the problem that was there with the, the cap blowing off, etc., and then the various interventions, etc. They could have done it better. Um, yeah, I was not involved. That in, doesn't you don't get involved in that side? Not the operational right. side. Okay. More focus much more on just the compliance. Yeah. Excellent. What other what other what are other great sort of uh, cases in your career that you could tell me about? Oh, what are you most uh, proud of? Um, really, more more than any individual cases. I, I hesitate to mention sure. okay. it's almost, almost all sort of confidential. Yeah. Um, and I think it's together with Joe Murphy, who mm -hmm. you mentioned meeting, um, really creating through writing we did together uh, a body of knowledge that would help give compliance and ethics sort of more rigor more body, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, but doing that in a way that doesn't um, make it all rigid and um, uh, you know, less ethics-y. You know, I, I think I'm proud of, uh, and I know Rebecca Walker, my partner, feels this way too, of kind of maintaining strong ethics while introducing strong compliance. And I guess the way I look at it, this can sound sort of corny, but uh, that's kind of what I do. So I say corny things. Um, that if you take the, the for a given company, the um, program, the ethics part of the program can get, or the compliance part of the program can give the company body, and the ethics part of the program can give it soul. So body and soul. Okay. And I think we need both. Um, and I think we've done that, um, Rebecca Walker and I, uh, and um, I'm proud of that. Excellent, excellent. Even if, if I can't put a name on it. If you were, um, if you talk to students in the future, you know, ten years, twenty years time, of go read what I wrote on this. Which which one of your uh, works would you say? Pick uh, up the ones that are there's a lot of articles. Mm -hmm. What I'm most proud of is the conflict of interest blog. Uh, that, okay. 800 uh, posts on different ways of dealing with conflicts of interest, which have always interested me, um, but also a lot are on the field called behavioral ethics. And that's the field of uh, social science that teaches we're not as um, ethical as we think, and then just as the Princeton study did that we yeah. talked about before, and the other case that led to my road to Damascus experience. Um, that uh, in this blog really written those up, those cases, those experiments in a way that hopefully can be helpful to people. Well, it's interesting you from what you mentioned earlier on Princeton. I'm thinking of um, it's a sort so psychology of, of behavior and and the way people. Nobody I think gets up in the morning thinking I'm going to be the bad guy today. Um, how how do people? What's the what's the chain typical chain of events that makes people do wrongdoing? Pressure, um, and it can have a huge effect, like in that Princeton study, but really in others too. Um, it's uh, it can overwhelm almost the best of intentions. I'm not saying Mohammed Gandhi would do, do it, but those of us who aren't ethical superheroes um, are much more likely to succumb to pressure. Uh, and there's lots of cognitive biases that behavioral ethicists have uh, that can um, uh, contribute to it. In your opinion, is it a distinct profession nowadays? It's not. It's getting closer to being a distinct profession. Um, you know, there's no one body of knowledge, but that's okay. The behavioral ethics part is contributing to that, but, you know, economics is part of the picture. Uh, law, obviously, is... Uh, a lot of what falls under the human uh, resources uh, bailiwick uh, is part of it. 
it, it is a distinction. I mean, I think you know that's moving in the right direction, and I do think it's something that people are thinking of as um, you know part of a crush because when they hire, that's what you know. They increasingly, the front, the first line of a um, job posting uh, for something in this field says uses the phrase compliance and ethics officer. And so that's what makes it a profession. And we'll continue to make it a profession. And, and, so, and the government views it as a profession too. So when we evaluate compliance programs, um, um, they're looking for people with experience. And is there anything that the organi- you know, the, uh, the the professional organizations can do to support you and, and everybody else in that? Is there anything else that you need? Oh, you know, I think that, I mean, unlike some other areas, this one isn't hurting for funds. I think there, I mean, there may be some cases where uh, individuals, you know, could use funding for uh, experiments, uh, ethics experiments, whether or not they're called. Um, but for the most part, I think they're in strong shape. And, you know, as long as you, and I would say that in some companies, their travel bans and they don't um, uh, allow people to go to conferences. And I think that's a uh, can't speak for any one company, but sort of a mistake, or often a mistake, because you really can learn a lot at these conferences. Yeah, yeah. Lovely. Final question, and then I'll, then I'll let you go. And thank you very much for all your time. Um, can you, off the top of your head, top three, four people that you think have, have uh, been key in, in uh, creating the discipline? Well, Joe Murphy, yeah. or, uh, maybe years ago, Duke Ellington, I was asked who was the one true master of jazz, and he said Louis Armstrong, and I would say the one true master of compliance is Joe Murphy. <laughs> he really did create the field uh, much more than anyone. There's not even a close second. Uh, I think Rebecca Walker, my partner, mentioned before, has had a huge influence because she publishes a lot. Uh, speaks a lot, organizes a lot of conferences, always helps people, uh, and is very practical oriented. And so is able to uh, provide advice to clients in ways that um, are accessible and um, reasonable. So she's had a long influence. Wynne Swenson um, is the per- a person who Joe Murphy and I wrote a book with on compliance, and he drafted the sentencing guidelines in 2000, uh, 1991, uh, and so he has a historic role uh, there. Uh, there's a compliance consultant named Sneed Priest, ethics and compliance, and like what I described, Rebecca and I tried to do, he does a very good job and creates very good examples of having both ethics and compliance as part of your picture. So Sneed um, Priest is... Uh, Deserve, I'm not sure if we're creating the faces for Mount Rushmore here, but uh, <laughs> I think you're creating the, the ideal, the fantasy football league, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> the fantasy football team. You know, the, yeah. the great team together. And any any last advice for any young compliance officers starting off in their career? Um, yeah, and that is going to sound like a closing on downer, and hopefully it isn't. Um, but you be aware that it can be a dangerous job, that the people do get retaliated against. Sometimes they lose work. And sometimes they can't find work. Uh, it's easier to find work as a, a run-of-the-mill lawyer than it is a compliance officer if you're in, say, a small middle, middle American city. There may be only two jobs, compliance jobs, in your region at any given time. So you, you, know, you have to have be ready and mentally ready and hopefully have some savings uh, for uh, kind of sh- showing up the defenses should you ever get fired for the wrong reason. Right. Great advice, I think, on that. 